Hello, hello, and welcome to the third Wheelhouse Talk uh, of this semester. It'll be the final one before we all head off on to Thanksgiving and Christmas break, and we'll pick it back up here again in January. But uh, welcome, and it's great to see all of you here. This is the day after elections. I'm sure all of you uh, were out last night, uh, glued to your TVs. If you were with me, I, I went out on the town and, and they projected a big picture up on the wall, and it was great to see so many people out and active and enthusiastic about what was going on. And, but regardless of your political affiliations, who or what candidate you wanted to win, uh, or what cycle it's even in, there's one thing that I believe remains constant uh, across any political discussion or, or election, and that's the fact that we have to work together. We have to work together. Here in the community, as a nation, as a state, we have to work together. And so I think it's fitting that the day after the elections, here we are at the wheelhouse talk, and it's kind of one of the key points that I keep uh, reiterating every time we're here together is the fact that um, here at the helm of the wheelhouse, uh, we get to generate the most power as a group and as a team. And so we have to take that responsibility upon ourselves to, to make the change here in the community, regardless of, of kind of what's going on around us, we have to make the best of every situation. And that always will remain constant. So we're about to introduce a wonderful speaker. I'd like to um, also say thank you to Provost Davis, who is here today from Grand Valley. Uh, Grand Valley's support is uh, much appreciated here at the Hallenstein Center. And I'm going to bring out uh, an individual who has She's going to be introducing Dean Ansack in a second, but she has really uh, benefited from the mentorship opportunities that the Hauenstein Center has uh, has given to its fellows. And so I encourage the rest of the fellows to, to listen to Abigail's uh, thoughts with the mentorship program uh, and, and continue to seek out those opportunities. So Abigail DeHart. It is my pleasure to introduce to you today Fred Anzac, Dean of Grand Valley State University's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Now, Dean Fred actually grew up here in Grand Rapids and graduated from West Catholic High School. From there, he went to Notre Dame and then received his PhD from the University of Chicago in an interdisciplinary program called the Committee on the Analysis of Ideas and the Study of Methods. He was an award-winning teacher scholar at the Universities of California, Berkeley, Virginia, and Iowa, and he has been the recipient of various service awards. He is the author of Thought and Character, a book which won the Phi Beta Kappa Award. Dean Friend has shared his expertise with programs like NPR's All Things Considered as house expert on rhetoric at the Democratic Convention. So clearly a highly successful scholarly career. But how did he find his way back here to Grand Rapids? Well, he was eventually recruited back to be the founding dean of CLASS, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, in 2004. He himself says, I never imagined coming back to Grand Rapids after 34 years away. But now he's here, and he is a culture builder, teacher, and manager of change at Grand Valley. He has been part of the Hallenstein Center's advisory cabinet since 2009, which brings me to my more personal note. Dean Fett is my mentor, as Austin was saying, and so if I haven't already convinced you, let me personally assure you he has a lot of great experiences and valuable insights on leadership. I have learned, whether it's through having a cup of coffee with him or watching him act as part as Dean, that this man can portray more in three words than I can in three paragraphs. And so for this, along with many other reasons, I'm excited to hear his talk today. Another thing I've learned about Dean Fred is he loves good titles to his talks. So, I'm going to read to you his title today, which has changed about 10 times, and actually, changed. <laughs> it's changed since I got here. He came up to me with a post-it you note know, and said it's changed again, so you know it's good. It, it might have changed again since we last talked about it. <laughs> okay, the same. So, here's the title. Walking the Talk, Rhetoric as a Practice of Ethical Leadership. So please join me in welcoming Dean Fedanzak. Well, I see that we have people in the furthest rows. We call that on the day um, after election, the uh, sleep rows. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Abigail. Thanks to Gleaves Whitney for the invitation. Thanks to the fellows for um, your, your brilliance and your sufferance. I'd want to say to uh, Colonel Howenstein, thank you for all you've done for my hometown in 
my university. And thanks especially for this program, uh, its results uh, for ethical and effective leadership will exceed in the long term your, your greatest dreams. And finally, thank you to everybody else who came on election hangover day. <laughs> um, I, I hope your favorite candidate won. If not, I hope you don't take it out on me. <laughs> um, but thank you anyway for the opportunity to address you on the topic of leadership. And let me admit from the outset that I find it a, a humbling topic to think about. It, uh, it's also kind of a pain in the, be in the neck um, <laughs> in that it uh, made me live that much more of an examined life for a few weeks. And I hope some of my thoughts will be transferable, uh, especially in ways I can't even contemplate uh, for the leadership roles you will play and you already play. To start, I want to uh, put you into my shoes uh, almost nine years ago. Imagine considering a dean position um, in which the provost wants you to unite three divisions in the university that are so separate that they had different tenure promotion processes, different curriculum development, and even different ways of keeping the books. The College of Liberal Arts and Sciences class was formed through the merger of uh, three existing divisions, each with their own individual strengths and traditions, as well as each with some people who had long memories of and, and deep convictions about the structures of governance uh, at Grant Valley. And although several universities include colleges of arts and sciences of similar size and scope, I came here from the University of Iowa, which um, has a class of almost exactly the same uh, size. There were deeply felt convictions about keeping the best from each of the divisions, keeping the Grand Valley character of them. During the Dean's search, I, I have to tell you that some skeptics call the position the Uber Dean. I think this sometimes expressed real concerns about it or their doubts about uh, finding someone who could meet its requirements. In that sense, it was about me and uh, part of the beginning leadership challenge was to make it about us. Today I want to talk about uh, examples of the active rhetoric by which I tried to ease those concerns, sometimes without directly addressing them. And I choose examples of leadership that, um, not because any of them are particularly original or innovative in the life of the dean or anybody else, but because seeing leadership practices as acts of rhetoric puts them in a specifically ethical context. And I'm gonna mean ethical, not with respect to any set of rules that I would observe or violate, but with respect to how rhetorical practices inescapably evolve the development and the practical capabilities of character. I probably don't have to argue to so sophisticated an audience that integral to leadership is the power and sometimes just the commitment to persuade. As the website of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee's program in rhetorical leadership notes, Leadership through rhetoric is vital for those with limited resources and formal authority 
who must rally primarily through language and, argu and arguments. I think that even those who have less limited material resources, rumor has it that there are still some of those wandering around these days. And those able to muster formal authority should, should rally others through persuasion. And this is hardly a novel discovery of my own. Whole books have been written on the relations, say, of presidential leadership and persuasion. Or um, take Nick Morgan in Forbes, who wrote that the communicating a leader does is all essentially persuasion. That's what leaders do. They persuade people to work together, to achieve more than they thought they could, to reach for apparently impossible goals, to put personal interests aside, at least temporarily, in favor of some larger group purpose. And Morgan sees some added urgency given the nature of our times. He says that Electronic communication and globalization have further eroded traditional hierarchy. People who perform work don't ask just, what should I do? But why should I do it? Persuasion, he concludes, has been widely perceived as a skill reserved for sales and negotiation. Now, it's an essential proficiency for all leaders. Well, because I'm a professor who professes rhetoric, you might expect me to talk today about leadership and words. There's a good talk there. Maybe you'll invite me back. <laughs> um, instead of talking about talk, though, I want to describe leading through rhetoric as an ethical practice, that is, how a leader can and should walk the talk. Any rhetorician after Aristotle will tell you that some of the most important elements of persuasion include the establishment of good character in the form of an abiding concern for audience and its mission, good sense and the pro provision of reasons that are worthy of assent, and goodwill in the nurturing of a shared passion. But let me put a finer point on the truism in my claim that leadership, uh, that rhetoric is an ethical leadership practice. On one level, that means that a rhetoric of leadership is not made only of words, although words remain necessary. Ethical leadership comprises the deeds that illustrate, manifest, enact the words. I'm not just saying what Emerson did when he went out on the Lyceum circuit, that what you do speak so loud that I cannot hear what you say. He had it right about when one's words and actions conflict, but the positive principle is maybe even more useful. What you say can speak louder, clearer, and more credibly if it's demonstrated, inhabited by what you do. To take on the Uber Dean's duties, but not all of the baggage that people's concerns had packed for me, I had to make it clear that I was not distant from the realities of the academic work they faced every day. I had to walk my talk from the first steps, because only by that walk could I transport myself to a place from which I could be heard. Let me illustrate in terms of three very humble examples that all of you will encounter as a leader too. Work assignments, public events, 
and communication. As dean, I've always taken on duties of a faculty member. I regularly teach courses. And I think uh, President Haas sets a great example by dropping in on class sessions. But I mean whole courses at every level from beginning general education to graduate courses um, in three departments so far, from first day enroll to semester's final grade. And since, as a leader, I'll be known by the company I keep, I encourage all those with doctorates in the class college office to take regular turns in the classroom. And I urge the associate deans to continue their research agendas to the extent that they find practical. I've also tried to keep my hand in the research end of the discipline um, by serving a couple years ago as a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellow. I love the NEH because they funded me three times. <laughs> Um, and starting this year by giving the service from an eagle's eye view, uh, an, a position of leadership as the executive director of the Rhetoric Society of America. So class faculty by and large know that they are led by people who are like them, also practicing teachers, scholars, this is what I mean when I say good leadership is an ethical practice. Leadership involves not only what you say, but who you are and who you are becoming. Your rhetoric is not only your words, but your public actions that give meaning to your words. And because your actions are public, it, they, they are um, inevitably something that acts, feeds back on your character. Sustaining one's credibility is not and can never be an isolated gesture. For me, it was a continuing discipline. I needed to keep walking the talk. One time behaviors wouldn't do in my case because there are always new people in the college. And the reality is, of university life and the fast changing disciplines in the arts and sciences are too fast evolving to rest on old worlds or on the aging understandings of what's a truly dynamic scene, but, but better be a dynamic scene. There's another rhetorical effect that feeds back on how I can lead and maybe how I can avoid some basic mistakes of leadership. Doing the tasks myself, I'm saying for making glib mistakes regarding academic work. I, Abigail suggested that um, I was at other universities. I was at Berkeley and Virginia and Iowa and before Grand Valley, I could never keep a job, um, and I, I've seen how impatient and frustrated with the glacial pace of academic change some people can be. Some administrators who've given up the experience of also being faculty fall into us and them binaries. And maintain the practice of professing a little and stay like them, it's easy a much larger, more diverse us. Now, while I hope my rhetoric is ethically changing other people's minds, informing them with what they need to know, and building consensus on which we can act together. It's also an ethical leadership practice in that it changes me, changes my actions, and thereby 
shapes how and with what credibility I can be heard. Just as Saul Bellow said, um, his characters, especially his narrators, were much better people than he is. Um, I would say that uh, I'm, I'm a much better person, more patient, more curious, um, more persistent uh, in being a dean. Not better than Saul Bellow. <laughs> Let's put it this way, an audience simply listens differently to someone who takes a turn with them at the awards instead of just calling the cadence all the time. So that's workload. What about events? Well, I try to participate in this wherever my time and talent are appropriate to the task however hilarious the results. For example, I'm famous for the passages I select to read in the whole marathon. And I think it is good for the uh, character and the, the energy of a young faculty member to hear their dean reading about Achilles raging across the field and tearing the hearts out of uh, opposing soldiers, they, they tend to sit up straight when they're listening to that. <laughs> I agreed to appear in the Bollywood version of Midsummer Night's Dream, and they gave me a cool role. Um, I was the buffoon, the buffoon <laughs> who provides a moment of comic relief, and it was mostly physical. But then, articulates Shakespeare's aversion to Elizabethan censorship. For some reason, though, they wouldn't let me join the company in the dance. I don't understand it either. <laughs> Where I can't jump in myself, I'm an active creator of traditions for our still new community, ranging from tuba bands at the holidays and you're all invited to the Kirchhoff Center, uh, December 12th, 1 o'clock, tubas and euphoniums uh, on, on your, your Christmas favorites. Um, to a set of awards distributed at our annual two public events, recognizing everything from great teaching to leadership in governance to devotion to student safety in studios and labs. Yeah, part of the leadership um, that I practice is what Aristotle called epideictic. That is, to be cheerleader in chief. And that is the easiest and most informative and most fun part of the job. Having always to know more and respect more about the cutting edge of knowledge in different parts of the arts and sciences in our pedagogy and in our service to students and to the broader community is just one of the ways my ethos, my character, is committed to and changed in leadership practice. Now, in a college that has, in any given semester, eight or nine hundred faculty and staff working towards its goals, this would make me, I'm told, a colonel in, in the army, um, no epaulets or anything. Uh, we have to think about internal communication as a necessary scene of leadership. We're moving from events to actually talking to people. And I want to describe this in two sort of action-based ways. Communicating by cultivating leaders and communicating by understanding and anticipating the needs of broader audiences. I want my department's chair chairs to know I value their time and their efforts. So I think our meetings have to reflect that the value in action. We avoid wasting time simply by dispensing information. 
whenever possible, we put information in a weekly mailing that goes to both uh, department chairs and faculty. Instead, we use our time together as if it were scarce, that is to say, precious. And we have conversations that actually change minds, including mine. We regularly ask the chairs to share their best practices about problems they're facing. We consistently request and respond to their suggestions for the meeting agenda. Often, we bring in experts on topics they've told us are of interest to them. They come to feel a stake. Gradually, it becomes their meeting, too. And I remember somewhere in the third year when the talk at that meeting went from a particularly departmentally based uh, kind of discourse to one that used the pronouns we and us. It's regularly one of the most functional meetings I've ever seen in an academic setting, which is saying something. <laughs> because the chairs are disposed by the way we treat them to be leaders themselves. To help spread these benefits to faculty and staff, to alumni, and to other audiences, my, audit, my office produces many kinds of communication. Uh, we, as I, I told you, we have this weekly mailing. We have a website of over a thousand pages. Uh, we have a monthly faculty newsletter with features on different faculty. Um, and every year we produce about a 25 page report. Um, in presidential years, it's a compendious report on everything. And then in the successive years, it would be teaching in 13, research in 14, and service in 15, accountability and transparency. What characterizes all of this, however tacitly, is that each of these communications are tailored to specific audiences, but each are timed for when that audience needs to know. So not only do they convey information, they say to the recipient, we know who you are. We know what you're going through and what you're going to face. And so what might otherwise seem burdensomely additional information becomes instead a little bit more like a lifeline extended to a, to, to a struggling uh, person by a sympathetic and knowledgeable friend. And with your indulgence, I'm going to talk like a rhetoric professor for just a few sentences. Because, because all of these leadership practices belong in the context of the history of rhetoric. Kenneth Burke, for example, studied identification the kind that can happen when people come to see you less as a distant Uber D and more as someone sharing something special with them. Credentials, to begin with. Experiences, values. Ferg also gave us a critical methodology to analyze the, the pageant, the ritual, the dramatic action of college events. And we do a lot of music and, and uh, other setups for just that reason. Aristotle. <coughs> I, I promised you Gleaves, no Cicero, but here's Aristotle. His development of the nth meme, shamelessly of different nth memes, supporting the same claim for different audiences, theorized why you don't belabor what any set of listeners will already grant you, but you always seek to give them what they need at the moment when they know they need it. Timing, the Greek word is kairos, 
is part of the realm of rhetoric. And my own mentor, Wayne Booth, who was a dean for a while and absolutely hated it and was completely amazed that, that my head did not explode. Booth explained how cells are forged in rhetoric, how, quote, a self is essentially rhetorical, symbol exchanging, a social product in the process of changing through interaction sharing values with other selves. Even when thinking privately, I can never escape the other selves which I have taken in to make myself. And my thought will thus always be an inclusive dialogue. Okay, the rhetoric theory part is over. In the, in the end, I understand that it doesn't address the practical question. Obviously, this kind of leadership is more work than just telling people what to do. At least at the front end, it is. It certainly puts more of the leader's character at stake. So why should another dean or a prospective leader of any kind listen to this? Well, like any other form of leadership, the reason is rooted in whatever the practice is that you're trying to lead. The vocation of teaching and learning is a high passion enterprise for both our faculty and our devoted staff. We are a dream factory. What a professor does is make opportunities, gateways, to better lives for many people who just barely dreamed it could be possible for, if not themselves, for someone in their family. First gen in college people like those Grand Valley serves, like me. And I came back to Grand Rapids to provide people I know and people I'm related to and now their kids and their grandchildren, boy, with exactly these opportunities. I came home to invent class as exactly this kind of generational gateway. As an academic leader, I can't forget that the heart of what we do is to put dreams in reach. And if that is the purpose of our practice. Attention must constantly be paid to the emotional well-being of the college. Classes D must regularly articulate, appreciate, and reinforce our common commitment to what matters among us. Now, how do I know this works? Well, there are lots of kinds of proofs, but I'd like to think one bit of evidence is the emergence of many new leaders, each developing his or her distinctive voice in the course of their leadership, and after a point, each making my job easier. When your faculty take up positions, key positions, within the larger university structure, as ours have in the class departments, of course, but in the Brooks College, in the provost's office, in faculty senate, or when your coaching tree includes new deans at other colleges in places as disparate as Ypsilanti, Michigan, and Universidad de Ibagué in Tolima, Colombia. When a student on your advisory committee in what seems like the twinkling of an eye becomes your dog's veterinarian, when your faculty are contributing spectacularly to everything from GDSU's enviable record of producing Fulbright scholars to a flurry of major grants, one at a rate more than twice the national norm, to bringing their disciplinary colleagues from all over the region and nation here to GDSU in large conferences that 
show off the university and the city. Well, then you can tell that at least some things are being led in a good direction. About Grand Valley's largest college, the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, I can probably say that all these things are broadly, frequently, and powerfully true, have been getting to be true for more than eight years up to this moment. And I'm not proud of what an Uber Dean did, but of what we've empowered our college to do together. And I say this knowing that empowerment takes constant renewal. So no later than this afternoon, I better get back to being the dean I'm always becoming in my rhetoric. Thanks.